Hello, welcome to Power Up Thursday. We are we are live with our best educator ever, Rabbi Uri Nahum, our one uh, and only our favorite. And uh, tonight we're gonna discuss a very interesting topic. You know what? I'm not gonna present it. I'll just uh, let it uh, let, let the rabbi speak. Okay, so the subject today is the subject of marijuana. I really don't want to get into this. I don't like to talk about this, and I'm being videotaped, which, uh, okay, I guess I have to videotape it, of course. The rabbi tells you to do something, you do it, right? We listen to our rabbis. So that will lead us to our next subject. We're talking about marijuana. So the question was asked, no, you're allowed to do, you're allowed to smoke marijuana, what's the problem with smoking marijuana? So we have to know something very, very important before we get to the answer, which is going to be no, okay? I don't want to like, oh, no. But we'll get to that why and explain everything before we get to that. We have to understand something very, very fundamental. And that is, the Jewish people don't just have, you know, a tradition, a law. We do. We're a very, very old tradition. We have the law of, of the Torah from the very beginning. But the Torah was interesting. It's interesting that the Torah, we know, has two parts. Torah Shabbat, the written Torah, and the oral Torah, Torah Shabbat Peh. We've been studying Prakava for the last couple of years every Thursday, and of course we had a lot of breaks, and that's why we stop every here and there. <laughs> but we've been studying it, and really, if you notice that the whole Prakava, how it started, and which is probably the central Masechet, the central tractate of the whole Torah Shabbat Peh, begins with this Moshe Rabbeinu received the Torah, he passed it on to Moshe, and Moshe, I mean to Yeshua, and Yeshua passed it on to the elders, and the elders passed it on to the prophets, and, the, and it goes on. Why is that list? And then after each Mishnah tells us which leader, which rabbi, why do you have to tell me the rabbis and the leaders who they were? Tell me the law. And those who study Gemara will see that almost every, every law is quoted by a rabbi. To almost it sounds like the Torah, Shabbat Peh, which really we know came from God, it sounds like rabbis made it up. Right? Which is the furthest thing from the truth. We know it's not made up by rabbis. It's really just happened to be quoted by the rabbis, but it's something that's clearly passed down in tradition. So why is it that the emphasis is always on the rabbis and the rabbis and the rabbis saying and the rabbi says and the rabbi says? And the answer is because the Torah was given not as, you know, I'm giving you mashal to understand this. You know, a person who builds a table, he has no relationship to the table. He builds a table and he walks away from the table. The table could, whatever it decides to do in its life, it's going to be sold, it's going to be transferred, it's going to be, right? He just goes away from the table. There's no connection with the table. It doesn't need this constant uh, input to make sure the table functions. Unlike, for example, let's say a website or, or a website that's updated with, you know, with uh, on the scores or whatever it may be or on the news, it needs constant uh, attention for it to be able to work. That's a mashal, that's a parable for us to understand really how the Torah works. God didn't just give the Torah and walk away and say, here's a book, figure it out. Or whatever you have questions, I'll tell the prophets and you'll have the answers. And, you know, pretty much do what I tell you. No, Torah is on a constant, it, it, it needs constant attention. And God is constantly feeding in, to the rabbis and to the leaders of the generation the wisdom and the needs to understand the Torah based on that generation. And therefore, we believe not just that the Torah was given to Moshe, and it is, this is, you know, Moshe gathered from God, but we believe also that the leaders of each generation, they have a tremendous siyata dishmeya, which means heavenly assistance in their rulings, and their rulings come also from God. Go will show you something a little extreme. The Bet Yosef, who's the Bet Yosef? Rabbi Yosef Karo, who wrote the Shohan Aruch, in his uh, famous book, the Bet Yosef, you know, that's the, you know, people know Bet Yosef today just as meat. Bet Yosef is much larger than the was, okay? <laughs> Bet Yosef was huge, okay? He wrote the whole Shohar, he's the greatest star rabbi, you know? And um, the, the, the Bet Yosef used to learn with an angel every day. And there was a book that has been written, a very Kabbalistic book, which records the conversations that he and the angel had. The first time that an angel appeared to him was on the night of Shabbat. He was still living in Egypt, and thus the name Rabbi Yosef Karo. Right, which really came from Cairo, Cairo, Egypt, and he was sitting there learning with ten men, and as they're learning, the Shlah records the story. The Beit Yosef's mouth just opened, and a voice was heard from there, and says, "You guys are doing tremendous things in heaven, and this is since the time the Beit Hamikdash was destroyed until now, God has not had such a, 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 a wonderful feeling from people who come together. Keep it up." And the Hashem should bless you, and he gave a lot of blessings. The next night, they decided to stay up again. And they stayed up again, and again the voice came out, 
But this time he told them, pick up, pick yourselves up and go to Eretz Israel. You'll do much greater there. And that's how Rabbi Yosef Karo moved from Egypt to Eretz Israel, where he is buried in Sfat. Good? Now, it seems like ever since then, Rabbi Yosef Karo continued to learn with this angel. And there's a book called the Magid, the Sefer Magid, which is Magid Mishneh, which is the book, no, is it Magid Mishneh? I'm forgetting, maybe I'm confusing with a different book, but it's called the Magid, where it's a recording of the conversation between Bet Yosef, right, who is the author of the Shana Ruch, where we all follow the laws of Shana Ruch, and this angel. And one place over there he tells him, you made a mistake in your ruling, but in Shamaim they accepted it. And therefore that became accepted as a halakha. Now you're going to ask, what does that mean? You can make a mistake? And the answer is not that. You can make a mistake against the Torah. But the Torah can be interpreted this way and that way. And there's mahlokit. And maybe you should have ruled this way. But what you ruled was still within the laws, within the, you know, the, the, the borders of halakha, the confines of halakha. And therefore, it's accepted. So that's a little bit of an extreme story, of course. There are people who make mistakes. But we believe that our leaders, the great leaders, especially when it comes to important subjects, they give a ruling with this heavenly assistance. And if we really want to come down to the nitty-gritty of it, right? when we hear a ruling of a great rabbi, which doesn't make sense to us, and we think that he made a mistake, we should stop for a second and just step back a little bit and say, one second, I have this rabbi over here who's been studying Torah since he was, you know, he, since he came out of his mother's stomach, you know what I'm saying? The only break he had is during childbirth between the angel and, you know, coming out. That's the only break he had, right? And he's clearly accomplished. He knows the Torah inside out, and he knows every little detail. Clearly, I know from his other writings, and I believe he made a mistake over here. I, right, may not know as much, but I believe that he made a mistake. So it's really pretty much me versus him. You understand? So we always got to think about it that way. Whoa, could people make a mistake? Yeah, but you need big people to figure out the mistake of the other people. But for us to come down and say, you know, they made mistakes here. Now, this is the only introduction I'll tell you why. I want to first bring down in 1970s, Rav Moshe Feinstein, I believe it was 1974, 1976, Rav Moshe Feinstein, I'll tell you exactly what it is, 1973. 1973, according to the Tshuva over here, Rav Moshe Feinstein writes a responsa where he talks about marijuana, as he puts in parentheses over here, with the Inul Ashkenazi, put the Ayn, when they say, ah, oh. so ma- marijuana, he writes, marijuana, okay, so he writes it over here, hashish, those who may be more familiar with that terminology, okay, which in Arabic just means grass, but we know it's a different type of grass, okay, so he writes over here, now, I'm going to read it, translate it, I'm going to pick out the points from it, and I'm going to, we're going to discuss what we, what's relevant to us, what's not relevant to us. And now I'm going to tell you what I saw on a website. I looked up, I said, I wanted to see what other... Some guy, I don't know who it is, and going and speaking against Ramosha Feinstein, and he says, no, he was misinformed and everything else. So I, that's why I give that introduction. I want to discuss it a little bit. Okay? So let's see. So he's writing a response to the same rabbi, and the rabbi is, it seems to me in the question he was telling him, we found a few yeshiva guys started to smoke marijuana. So he says, Pashut davar asur. It is simple that this is something forbidden. Why? Mikam ma'ikare dinim she Wait one second. He says, because based on a few fundamental principles in halakha and the Torah. Hada, number one. Shu mekalkelum chalei taguf. It destroys the body. It harms the body. Okay? I am not the doctor. I'm, this is not a field that I, that I discovered or I, I, I went into or I re- even looked into. I don't know, but it seems to be a little bit harmful. It's definitely a little bit harmful. And we know the only thing, so everybody can say, oh, you can eat fried food. I love that. You know, I used to have guy, I used to go up to this guys who smoke. He tells me, you know, a lot of smoke. First this month, you don't eat fresh fries? Yeah. Oh, do you know how old the fries are? I mean, actually, the oil is. You know that they never change it, and you and you come and tell me that I shouldn't smoke. Yeah, but last time I bought French fries, it didn't say you'll die from the French fries on the cigarette box. It does say that, <laughs> right? <laughs> what are you comparing? You know, it's, there's obviously a, a huge comp- difference between this guy who's smoking and this guy who's eating French fries. And also, I'm not eating French fries every five minutes when I get stressed out, yeah. right? <laughs> you are smoking every five minutes, or and and you get stressed every moment. There you go, another guy. No, I'm getting it. <laughs> So, what are you comparing, obviously? But let's leave that on the side, okay? So he says here, yeah, it, it, first of all, one problem is that it harms the body. We're not allowed to do anything to harm our body. Yes, our body is holy. When a person passes away, you know what they do to the body? There's a 
group called Hebra Kaddish, I'm sure you've heard of it. And Hebra Kaddish can be volunteers, can be paid for, it doesn't make a difference. When they take the body, if he's a person who usually shaves, they'll shave him. Not with a razor, obviously, even though he's dead. They'll shave him. They'll give him a haircut if his hair is too long. And in the case where once I was a little bit involved, where a person got into a car accident, not that I had my hands on, but whatever, he, I was in the hospital when the person, you know, didn't make it. He got to the, uh, and he was full of blood. They clean him up. They make him, and they dress him in something nice, right? The shrouds are actually something presentable. And they prepare him. He looks actually very good. They wash him. They wash the inside. They wash the outside. Why? Because the body is holy. And we may not take any part of the body after he died for whatever reason. Unless it's save somebody else's life. That's something else. But we're just not taking The body is holy. And we're preparing it for tahiyyat hamitim. We believe one of the 13 fundamentals is that the body will get up again in the resurrection of the dead. That's not something that is theoretical. It's a nice Jewish myth. It's part of our lives. We know that there will be tahiyyat hamitim. And therefore, when a person dies, it's not over. He's just getting up much, much later. And therefore, we prepare him for that time when he will come back out from the dead, which is known as Tahiyat Amitim. The body is very important. Therefore, we don't do anything in our lifetime to harm the body willingly. Okay? That's number one. He says, <coughs> Even if you can tell me, you know what? Yeah, it harms the body, but you know what? It's not more harmful than eating a pizza and, and cards and whatever they tell you, all these things. And there's some people that physically fit, they can handle it, they won't. Yeah, it hurt, but nothing major, which is not such a big problem. So he says, still, It messes up a person's mind. And they cannot, when a person smokes this, he cannot really focus and really understand something proper. He says over here, This is even worse than hurting one's body. Besides that you prevent yourself from learning Torah like you're supposed to. You cannot fulfill any mitzvah properly because your mind is lost. As they say, you're in cloud nine. Right? You're gone. You're, you're not really here. Yeah, it's all good. Right? You're not really here. And therefore your Torah mitzvah, you're supposed to, you're supposed to do it with right intentions with the right thoughts you're not doing it so that's another problem I ain't scared okay the odd shehu gorem ta'ava gedola causes a tremendous desire in the person much more than eating now this you gotta be one to know one you know what I'm saying I don't know what this means that if you smoke weed all of a sudden you get this great big desire that you start one desire to eat or, 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 or much more than eating he seems to say over here I don't know munchies, munchies yeah. <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> how do you know it's, uh, somebody told you also <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I heard from another rabbi you also heard from another rabbi it's all the rabbis all the one they know okay right she says absolutely even if it's kosher he says even if it's kosher he says who is sur hamush and never been sur we're going to read it in a few weeks the Torah talks about a ben sur remore it's a very interesting mitzvah this is, a, this is a child, this is a person who the, steals from his parents a little bit, a some amount of money, and he goes, he runs after his desires. And the Gemara says, and the Torah says, you execute it. Now, this case never actually happened, as the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, it never actually happened that somebody actually got executed for it. Although that seems to be debatable, the Gemara, but it's according to one opinion, it never actually happened. But the Torah is telling you a concept to run after one's desires, even though you're eating everything kosher, but just to be a person running after desires is forbidden. Not that it's not recommended, it's forbidden. Yes, a person who's new and he's coming back, so you obviously are taking from non-kosher to kosher, you know, when, when that bridge, right, you're not going to tell him, whoa, 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 cut down anything, you know, the guy's going to, you're driving the guy crazy, right? But a person has to know that we don't live for our desires. Our desires are really there to help us just, you know, get to the next, uh, to be able to survive. It's not that we survive to eat or we decide we live to eat. We don't. That's not just not Jewish. That's against the Torah. It sounds a little rough, but that's the reality. It's against the Torah. So he says, when a person smokes this, this kind of stuff, that's what it does to him. Again, I don't know. I didn't know from the beginning. I don't know after, but that's what he's saying. That's another problem that comes with it. Now, he says more. Ve kol sheken she asu labi asmon leta vagedola odyoter. 
who the Bashar Leka Shum Tsurkh Ladam is Ishu Asur. And even more so, a person cannot put himself in this situation which is going to create a tremendous strong desire for things that are not needed. That's, he says, Asur. Although one doesn't get lashes on it, but the fact that Torah discusses it in detail, that that's what it, that's what it does. Thank you. There's another issue that happens with this. Usually the parents of the ones who are doing drugs don't like it. And not just don't like it. They're very upset about it. And everybody knows, you know, yes, they're also upset when they smoke. And guess what? That's again, that's transgressing the issue of Kibbut Abba'im. Honoring one's parents. So most people that do smoke drugs or marijuana, let's say, okay, parents don't like. He's gonna tell me what if the guy has pot with his father? Okay, so we don't have this issue. We still have the other issues. So the father also has an issue. Okay, <laughs> and yes, I do believe that there are people who smoke pot with their fathers. I I I, I totally hear that. Doesn't mean it's okay. I'm just telling you, you know that issue cannot never not be an issue. There was well, number four. There was the reason. That's number four. Okay. No, I'm asking. Oh, I wasn't counting. Oh, but... Yeah. <laughs> Quotes a Ramban. The famous Ramban in the beginning of Pashat Kedoshim, he says, the Torah gives a command, Kedoshim, to you must be Kedoshim. What does it mean, Kedoshim? That means, even what's permitted, a person is supposed to hold back. Not everything is permitted, we should have. Again, we're dealing with different people. When you're dealing with a person who is new and everything else, where you're trying to just get him to do something without, obviously, there's not, it's not on the list yet. Right? The guy was coming to Shabbat, right? So you, you, you work with the guy in steps. Same thing, the guy, we're going to tell him this mitzvah, he might not be able to handle it, but there are atheists that exist. And we all have to get to that point when realizing that not everything that's permitted, I should have. It's kind of like, you know, can you imagine? I don't know how many, besides the rabbi, I don't know how many people have uh, kids over here that are of age of that age I want to talk about. But the kid comes here, daddy can I have more candy. You know, it's one of those like Purim days of some hatola, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just like they're drugged up on, on these things. You, know? you say, how much can you read? But, Daddy, it's kosher. I know it's kosher, but you know how much uh, you, your mouth is full of cavities already. So what's another one? Right? <laughs> so you, you know, so it, it's not about ko- it's enough. You know, there's just certain you know, certain things that's enough, right? So it's the same thing that be with ta'avod with desires that Ramban says that not everything that's kosher is okay, right? Yeah, at certain times a person's on vacation or whatever, but in general, a person should. It's not a lifestyle. And it's Isur, according to the Ramban. One more thing he says, Okay, he says, besides that, it causes the other worst things. I skipped one paragraph because I don't want it to be too long. He says also that when they get, like the Benz when they get to the point where they don't have it, they begin to steal to get it. And I know that is for a fact, right? That when people are unable, when they're so addicted to anything, Right? So then, yeah, they, they can't have it. That, that can apply with everything. But usually this has an addictive nature. At least most people that get involved in this do have that issue. Is this a fact? Is this 80%, 70%? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't care about the studies. The question is like this. If it's enough, if it's happening to enough people, right? Is it worth it to take the risk to put it to, for you to be maybe that one person? Right? It's not, again... If this issue, I'm mean, forget about all the other issues. This issue of a person getting addicted to it and really like losing himself with it, doing, he needs to have it, and it might lead. I'm not saying, but it might lead to something else. Is it worth it entering such a state where it maybe gets you to something else? This is the famous teshuva, the famous response of Moshe Feinstein, 1973, on Rosh Chodesh Iyar, which was written, you know, in 1973. I'm not gonna do the math now, but that long ago. Uh, clearly, he says that it's marijuana. Some want to say no, he got it wrong description. I don't see anything really crazy wrong with the description of what marijuana is. I do believe that it, anybody who smokes could have all these issues, right? Maybe not the parents anymore, but the other parents, oh, okay, so we give him a little bit, right? But that is the issue. Certainly when a person, his mind, huh? No. The last issue of what? People stealing from People who, who don't have it, therefore they need to take money to steal from him. It doesn't apply. No. Okay. I, I know... You know, two people that doesn't apply to them. Okay, I got you. Uh, every person <laughs> I know that smokes never had an issue. It's what happened. It's if there's a claim, it's a gateway. Again, right? It's a gateway. That's what that, I said. There's a claim. That, no, that's not true. I'm not pro con. No, no, no. I got you. I'm also not, you know, pro. But, <laughs> but, but that's pretty much the, the tshuva. Now, I haven't seen anybody that says against. 
I haven't seen anybody that says, any, any real person, any real authority, rabbinic authority that spoke against uh, this Teshuvah. Yeah, of course, people who are smoking, also don't like this, you know. You know, what is he talking about? Does it apply? And, and all the people, like I said from beforehand, we believe that our, our, our Torah comes, not just our lifestyle comes also from the way the rabbis looked at the world, our current rabbis, and see the situation, and value up the situation, size up the situation, and they say, okay, this is how it should be done, how it should not be done. Did they have the correct information, not correct information? It doesn't make a difference. We believe that God, like Moshe Rabbeinu, like the, the, the Beit Yosef, God has, gives them heavenly assistance, that they guide us in the right way, in the right direction, and what we need to do. If there were opinions, I would have brought you opinions. But I haven't seen real opinions. Again, of course, you'll have people writing blogs left and right. Those mean nothing. I want to see a halakhic authority that comes and says, it's fine, it's not a problem, I haven't seen it. I looked a little bit online, but if it would have been that famous, somebody would have wrote against it to have seen it. But most of the spoke about a lot of things, but people disagreed with him. For example, the whole discussion of making an Ayruv in big cities, of Moshe Feinstein was very against. But there were big rabbis that disagreed with him also. Now, although these big rabbis don't compare to Moshe Feinstein, but at least somebody who is a real halakha authority said no. Right? He disagreed. And we have that left and right. But over here, I haven't seen anybody. I haven't seen anybody that comes and says, you know, Moshe Feinstein, a halakha authority didn't get it right this time. Or, no, I disagree because this and this is point. Nobody... I have not seen anybody. Okay, that's from a halakha point of view. And then we always have to discuss the other, is this, you know, is this something like a cigarette, even cigarettes itself, you know, when it comes to a, a Jewish home and a lifestyle, is this the right way that children should be raised? And seeing daddy and mommy or whatever it is going for such a thing. That's a, a different discussion. We're not dealing with halakha anymore. That's a different Torah, a hashkafa, you know, discussion of it over here so now we can take questions whoever has questions wants to hear we're still being recorded so they will hear you and <laughs> yes how is cigarettes different excellent question how is cigarettes different i agree i agree i agree with you and who said that cigarettes are fine no you just said it's a different it's a completely different thing no no oh so, so what i meant to say is that as far as this point as, as of animals. being high the point of getting high is a little different. Yeah? It's okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. I said it's fine. Um, getting high from cigarettes and getting high from marijuana is clearly different. But you're right. Even cigarettes, which are harmful to the body, which rabbi says that you're allowed to begin smoking cigarettes? Yes, one who already got himself and he's addicted, what are you going to tell him? Right? So I can tell maybe the same thing, a guy who's addicted to this and can't get himself out of it, right? It's still a problem. He's still, the person's still harming himself. Even if he's addicted, it's still a problem, right? And there's no... If you go to any halakhic authority say, I would like to start smoking, I don't know anyone that says, sure. Mm-hmm. You follow? It, it, seems, it, it yeah. seems like everything you said uh, could very well apply to alcohol as well. Yeah, of course. Alcohol so, but he the thing know, is, alcohol is very good. So I thought about this. I said, why is it different from wine? Why is it different from everything else? Well, wine, you, wine is a ritual drink. Like you need oh, to so, have. So, so that's, well, that's what, what about whiskey? What about that's vodka? Answer. What about tequila? So what everything about, uh, in moderation, mm-hmm. right, is not a problem. Everything in moderation is not a problem. The question mm-hmm. is, weed is something could it be right. done in moderation? Sorry. No, but on your chest. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. He also wants to listen to the class. I spoke about weed. <laughs> Come, okay. <laughs> so, so we have the rule of things in moderation. Okay. Let's see over there the difference by alcohol, as opposed to cigarettes and marijuana. By alcohol, there is an obligation, right, to have, for example, wine by Lil Hasidir, wine by Kiddush, right, by the night of Pesach, right. Wine. In wine. What was I? Yeah. But a person, but the poskim bring down that anybody who has issues with wine, even on the night which is the most obligation, any other night which is night of Pesach, you could ha- you should have grape juice and not wine. The Chacham of Adiyah brings it down clearly, and whether you're old and you can't handle, it, or whether you're a recovering alcoholic, you're not. You should not have wine either, because there is a substitute. There's something called grape juice, and if you are a recovering alcoholic and there is no other alternative, there is no grape juice, and you must have wine, then you only take those four cups, exactly what you need, and that's it. 
Are you understand? So anything that has an addictive nature, yeah, a person has to stay away from it. And yes, we do have a big, big problem in the religious world with addictions of things that are permitted according to halakha. Right? Like wine, everything else. That's why Amudim, an organization, was started because of these issues. We have many issues. This is one issue also. It's a real, real problem. In my shul, I banned alcohol and people are flipping out. We have, you know, and when I did it in the shul, I got a lot of less back. I held my ground and I put my foot down. It was a little bit, uh, you know, rough, but eventually got on the floor and we, Baruch Hashem, we pushed the weight. And of course, it was done in the way, in the right way, and explaining it to everybody. But I'll tell you a few reasons why I did it in a second. But then we, when I tell this to other people, what? You don't have alcohol in your shul? What do you mean? Every shul has it. Yeah. Do you know what the problems are going on? No. Okay. I would just buy a community where drinking is like a regular thing. You know what I'm saying? Like every second, like I didn't know it was a custom. Like if you, I want to have a drinking with you. I want to have a drink with you. And, and, and like, I didn't know that if, when I say, no, I don't drink. It's an insult. You know, like, <laughs> so, so, you don't know you have to drink. So, no, no, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything. So somebody came and said, Rabbi, look, here's a bottle of vodka. It's really water. Just go ahead. I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah, you go. I'm uh, lifting up my cup of water. Yeah. Oh, who this? How do you guys drink this? You know, me all it's water, and I'm okay. And the only had the rabbi can handle it. Okay, so <laughs> apple juice works for whiskey, if you want to know. So, <laughs> so in any case, right? So we all have it. We all okay. I'm. Um, it's not not an exaggeration, not a joke. A woman came to me, and she, you know, she came to me, and she's a woman who has grandchildren already. She has one kid at home. She has also other children that are married. And I'm not kidding. I don't, and I'm not like, you know me, I'm not like a storyteller and exaggerate my stories, which really took three hours, I say in five minutes, you know what I'm saying? But she came, literally with tears crying, about how her husband, uh, what's called, is addicted to alcohol. And I said, Jeru, anything about it? He says, yeah, last year, the, us and the kids confronted him, and we said, if this continues, we want out. And I said, what happened? He didn't listen, and I left the house. Until he realized he has nothing else, he came back, he said, I'm going to stop. But then he said, I said, so what happened? He says, three months later, he says, come on, how do you want me to go to all these events, his birthday parties and everything else, and I'm not going to have, just, I'm just going to have a shot over there. And I said, what'd you say? I said, okay, I felt bad for the guy. And now he's back on it again. And he has, so I said, okay, are you ready to live on your own and then to be with him? I'm not telling you this is the, it was a whole long discussion, but uh, he says, yeah, actually, yes. And this is what people don't realize. We look at the guy and he looks okay. He's drinking, he's having fun. This is why I stopped in my shul. I got phone calls from the spouses. And he says, yeah, who's the wife? I say, oh, you only tell you in front of every, it was your wife, right? That's why it was that guy. That's it. <laughs> you only tell everybody, what are you, crazy? Yeah, you want, you, want her, you, want, you want her to be shot by you and then, you know, come after me, you understand? So, obviously, and the same guys, the people don't realize it. And the guy who says, stop my wife, it was his wife. It wasn't one wife. It was a whole group of wives got together and they told her, please call the rabbi. One after all, they all have problems. They don't like how the guy comes home and he doesn't even realize it. The guy who's home, who comes home, the man who comes home and he doesn't want to eat, he starts yelling at all the kids and he starts yelling at his wife. Uh, yeah, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And then, why I really stopped it is because what happened in a different shul in our neighborhood. A guy was coming home, come, you, know, you know, just having from the shot in shul, just a little bit of shot in the shul, you know, which shot here, shot here, shot here, before, you know, it goes on shooting. Okay, so now, he, um, the late, he used to come on, get in a fight with his wife and beat her. Lily hit her. So she went to the president of the shul and she complained. So the president of the shul said, ah, no, it's a, da, da. so what happened? So one day, he was sitting in his, the president of the shul was sitting having Shabbat lunch in the house. He has a, like a hard bang on the door. Opens the door, the wife is hysterical crying. He says, you don't know what my husband did to me today, and it's all on your head. And she cursed the daylights out of him. That shul put up signs, and they said, you want to bring for a yard site, you want to bring for whatever you want, no alcohol in this whole entire building. And if it's seen, it's discarded right away. When I heard that story, I did it by us. I said, what, should I wait? Oh, so one guy tells me, but Rabbi, it didn't happen to us. Oh, okay. You want me to wait till that wife gets beaten, and then... Well, how many hits you want? You know, like black and blues only on the arm, or like also on your face. Like, hakam may not be show. If you're smart, you see ahead. You look ahead, and therefore you see that there's an issue, and it's an issue everywhere. If you don't see it, it's because you don't know about it. And then I called up the there's an organization in our community which deals with many things. One of them is addictions. I said, do you have 
problems of people, you know, uh, I guess what the Ashkenazim call a kiddush club? Is it a real problem? I said, oh yeah. So would you come to the shul and speak? So yeah, we'll bring you many stories. I didn't have to bring it afterwards because whatever, there was an issue, whatever, it stopped. I don't have to bring it. But it's all over. You just have to call the people that are involved, you know, behind the scenes. I, I, I tell everybody, go on YouTube, write Amudim, okay, that's the organization's name, A-M-U-D-I-M, and write alcohol. They have a small video of five minutes where it shows you a typical shul, a small little kiddish club with their alcohol. And what, it's not like, you know, they, they're creating a problem. This is a real thing. Yes, so even things that are permitted, according to Allah, a person has to know. And when there are problems, we have to take the fe- offense means that there's no problem, but we're doing preventative action. We don't wait till the problem is there, and then we say, okay, let's try to figure out a solution. If there's a shaky bridge where people are falling and getting hurt, we make it that nobody's allowed to go on the bridge. We don't put an ambulance truck over there and say, oh, if you got hurt, we're going to take care of you now. Right? That's the... Wise men of Khelm, you know, you know, that's, you know that story, right? But if we, we say we put a fence, nobody's allowed to go. And the best way to do this, imagine you would get sued. Ah, oh, not everybody understands. Imagine you would get sued if somebody gets in trouble with alcohol or drugs or anything else. What would you do? Oh, big yellow tape, stay away. <laughs> you talk about people's money, you talk about Americans' money? No. Everybody understands that. When it comes to getting sued, it's every look, 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 you know, look at every uh, food company that they don't want to get sued. This may have traces of nuts. You know why? Because when they shipped it from the company to the store, there was a nut factory. You know what I'm saying? Well, one guy was roasting nuts. They might have traces of nuts. Don't sue us. You know what I'm saying? Stay away. That's how it is. When it comes to people's mind, they all know how to be careful. So for us, the halakha is very important to us. Judaism, religion is very important to us. And you, the, the Jewish body is very important to us. And therefore, these things... We don't want risks. We don't want to risk it, and therefore we take extra precaution. Do they apply in every case? No, but there's enough that people that they have problems with with this issue that we want to take that fence. We want to put up that fence. Okay, sorry, somebody else had a question. Um, I, I it's okay. I before, love the be, screen. It's looking before beautiful. Amosh, before Amosh, does anybody talk about it? Like I any, couldn't find anybody. Any Rishonim, I any, anything I in Tanakh, in Tanakh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't research it now because of the class. Uh-huh. This, I, ha- I happened to come of course of it years ago. Uh-huh. So when this class was discussed, somebody said, well, why are you going to talk about it? That's the only thing I knew. So I wanted to look up more. Is, is there it, anything or more? Is that the end of the Tshuva? Or there's more stuff? That's it. That's just a short yeah. Tshuva like that. So just to summarize, what, what are like the main four The main five? points that he said, and one, number one is, Effects it harms the body, mm-hmm. harms the mind for the moment that person's high. What we call a person's high, where he's not totally focused. Uh, it, it harms the what's it called? Munchies. The, the munchies. Oh, it gives <laughs> gives the guy the munchies. Okay, the which is creating a great appetite. <laughs> it's uh, what's it called? The parents are usually very upset about it. It's not kedoshim to you, and the issue that is he saying that really it's under control that people. Don't go out and steal or whatever, but you know people don't have that addictive nature where they can run and steal. But he said that it creates a situation or a possible situation where people will go out and because they don't have it, they're gonna have to go and do different things in order to get it, mm-hmm. like alcohol, like anything else. So, uh, just like, go ahead, I'm listening. Y- 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 the way you described alcohol, it sounds even more that alcohol is much worse than. Uh, I agree. So why why why? Like, I, I, like, I, I said, Fanch, they also have a chuva about alcohol or or like. It seems like Moran in, in, in uh, no moderation question. would be less harmful than There's alcohol. No question. Alcohol was already discussed way before. In Rabbi Moshe Faisal, doesn't have to speak about alcohol. Alcohol was already discussed from the Rishonim. There's a book called Urhot Sadikim in Char HaSimha. And over there he talks about the disgusting uh, nature of people who drink for getting drunk. Mm-hmm. And not only that, even on Purim, when you have to drink, everybody writes. Drinking means a little bit more not to get wasted. Anybody who gets wasted is not doing a mitzvah, he's doing an avira. That's even on Purim. There's not one post that says, everybody says clearly that one who is drinking on Purim has to be able to say Rechat Amazon afterwards, has to be able to pray afterwards, Arbit, right? And if he cannot do these things, it's not so for him to drink. Nobody says otherwise. Everybody says it like that. Not only that, in our days, the post came saying that uh, we all know the great, great sin of telling the non-Jewish government on a Jew, right? Getting a Jew in trouble financially, whatever it is, you know, going and tell everybody, oh, this guy is not paying his taxes, you know. We all know, we all know the, the, the great sin about that. So now the, um, what's it called? But the rabbis bring down, 
Now, if a guy, let's say Purim, this is when they talk about it, because, it's, you know, a guy who's drinking, and after he's drinking, he wants to drive, you, you must stop him. You take away his keys, and if he refuses to listen to you, you call the cops. You call the cops. Why? He's putting himself in danger, he's putting other people in danger. <gasps> but he's going to get arrested, and he get in trouble, and they take his money. Yeah, you call the cops. This they bring down. This they brought down. Not only that, all the rabbis of this generation, and it's a big poster, they put it up, all the rabbis bring, you take away the keys, and you call the cops, and you bring it down. You know, not only that, I know of a story. Now, she, this lady who did whatever she did in the story, I don't think she did it based on... A psak, right? But what she did, I agree with her 100%. There was a guy after Purim or during Purim who had a few shots and he was drinking and he was swerving. And he hid her car. Right? And she came out and she saw the guy. Like, she didn't know what was happening. But she saw the guy was... He says, Are you kidding? You're drinking and you're, and you're driving? She called the cops and had him arrested. And the guy was there with his family and everything else. But nobody else was ready to drive. She said, She got him arrested. I agree with that lady. Sounds harsh. But guess what? If has shalom, just like he was hitting a car here and there, it could have been a child. And it could have been anybody's child. Right? And that's not, again, it's not worth the risk. And yes, by alcohol, they do discuss it already from way before. Uh, the Rambam, uh, they quote the Rambam saying, when you see people getting together and they're getting drunk, it should look like people are just sitting there and making, you know, in the middle of everybody's laughing and having a good time. We all look at it as foolish. That's what happens really when people are drunk. So it is brought down. Yes, a little bit of wine is okay, but like, again, the moderation. But when we got to the point when there's no moderation, you know, everybody who tells you Lachaim, oh Lachaim, of course, and the Joseph and, and the Michael, and you know, so so that's, there's no end to it. So the person has to be smart. So they can be like a clear, okay, two shots is okay, three shots is no good, right? Because a big guy can handle four shots. You follow? So it's got to be done in like so. There's no clear. Uh, what's permitted, what's not permitted. There is a halakha of when a person stand up, stands up to Amidah and all these things that are very clear. But otherwise, to say this amount and this amount is not, okay. But over there, again, like we said, it's something that's part of, it's a regular food or whatever it is. But to create a new thing and to get yourself high, that I haven't seen anybody that says, you know, go ahead. So for medicine and everything else, okay, that's prescription like anything else. But that's something that doctor says that you need, okay. That's a different discussion. When you take one more question, because we got to run. I don't, Go know, these, I don't know these are like uh, just myths or like, uh, I forget what they're called. D- didn't the Kohanim smoke something or this is, this That's is a urban legend? Myth. No. Uh, urban legend, right? No, no. The guy who told you was smoking something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the guy who did not smoke anything. No. And around King Solomon's uh, burial site, didn't uh, the plants grow or not? Like, Look, it says that King Solomon planted all the plants in the world in Eretz Yisrael. He knew how to figure because everything really is could be found in Eretz He planted everything. Now you tell me he also smoked weed. That's a little far, far stretch of of, of, of taking the the simple meaning of the words and going a little extreme. Yeah, there was a, a fire in the Beit Hamikdash and there was smoke going up to Shemaim. Yes, there was. But to say that that smoke came from weed, that's like oh no, not weed, but they smoked something. No, 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 absolutely not. That, that's for sure not brought down. Uh-huh. But I told you, the guy who told you maybe he was smoking yeah, something. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? We're good? Okay. 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 So we're still taping the Kaddish. Amen. <laughs>